Hello everyone. In this lesson, we'll go over the fundamentals of AWS. These are important concepts that you need to know in order to be an effective AWS practitioner. If you're already familiar with AWS, this lesson will serve as a great recap. But if you're new to AWS, no need to worry at all. I'm gonna explain everything you need to know step-by-step. Step. Before we get into the actual content of the video itself, let's first go over the topics we're gonna to discuss. First, we're gonna cover cloud computing in general, in terms of how it's evolved and how we got to where we are today from a historic perspective. This is gonna dovetail nicely into our second topic, which is why AWS is so popular in the first place. Finally, we'll talk about three important AWS concepts, services, regions, and availability zones. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Up until the early 2000s or so, Every company that offered any kind of internet-based application had a server room. It looked a little bit something like this. So this is a server rack, and a server is just a fancy word for a computer, an advanced computer, but still, nevertheless, a computer. And these computers were used for a variety of different use cases. It could have been hosting web applications, hosting websites themselves, hosting APIs, hosting databases. There's really no limit to what the companies would do with these different computers. And these setups were ubiquitous. Every company out there had a server room. Some of them could be very small, like this one that you're seeing here, or they could be very, very large. In the case of large internet companies that required tons of compute power. But with these server rooms came a whole bunch of different problems. The first being that in order to actually set up the server room, you obviously need to buy all the hardware that goes into it. This is extremely expensive, and it's not just a one-time cost because these things can often fail and need to be replaced over time. So this is a cost overhead that companies needed to spend just to participate in the world of internet-based applications. I know we take this for granted now, we don't really think about buying hardware anymore when we're operating on the cloud, but this was the sad reality at the time. The second major problem was that scaling requires extensive planning when you need to buy your own hardware. So say for example, you had an application that was slowly growing and then all of a sudden there was a rapid spike in growth. At the time, this was very difficult to deal with because usually purchasing hardware, setting it up, provisioning it, getting everything ready to go took a considerable amount of time. It wasn't something that you could just flick a switch and then instantly have more scalability. No, this took many weeks, months, and often tons of financial planning in order to arrange. On top of that, not only do you need to purchase the hardware itself, but you need to maintain it. Hardware can fail pretty much at any time. We live in a world where it's very common to deal with hardware failures these days. And more and more, companies are relying on less powerful pieces of hardware that fail more often, but are easy to replace. To dig into this a little further, it doesn't just end with the cost. There's human capital as well. Highly trained individuals that you need to hire in order to set up, maintain, and monitor these server rooms and all the infrastructure around it. It's not just the initial setup cost, but it's ongoing cost that never really ends. And finally, having to set up your own server rooms and data centers takes away from the key business function that your business provides. This means that you're spending resources on infrastructure overhead instead of using that money to hire people to help you solve your critical business problem that delivers customers value. Now there's a whole bunch of other problems and we can probably talk about this topic for 30 minutes or so, but these are, in my opinion, the most important ones. This was just the cost of doing business. And this was just a common problem that every company had to deal with. And then in around 2006 or so, AWS came along. And AWS asked a very simple question, had a very simple idea. What if we take all these different companies that have their different server rooms, being very well aware of all the different problems with setting them up, maintaining them, and keeping them healthy, and we scaled that up, and we did all of that for them. Instead of each individual company now needing their own server room, we can do this for them. We can hire the people, we can industrialize this whole thing, and make it so that we set up these very large data centers that are locked down in terms of security, that are very highly stable, that have redundant power, internet, and a whole bunch of other goodness, and instead of each individual company having to worry about this themselves, we do it for them and we just charge a small fee for using our services. And that's exactly what AWS did. And they started out in 2006 or so 
by building some foundational products. And you can think of these as Lego blocks because they were primitive, very basic products that offered low level functionality that application developers would appreciate. One of the first products they started out with was Simple Storage Service, also called S3 for short. This product allows you to store any type of content that you wish. This can be large files, small files, it could be media content that's used for websites, it could be CSVs, JSONs, any type of file really that you want. This has grown to be more sophisticated over time, but the ability to just store raw information of varying types in the cloud and not having to worry about it was revolutionary at the time. Shortly after, they released another foundational service called Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2 for short. EC2 allowed you to rent servers from AWS. So as opposed to before, where you needed to set up your own server and then you had access to it, you could simply go to the AWS console, click a couple buttons, rent a server for a couple hours, and then give it back once you're done. If you need it for longer periods of time, that's okay too. AWS was offering a pay-as-you-go model, so you only pay for the amount of time that you have your instance up and running, which was revolutionary at the time. About a year later, another key service was released called SimpleDB, which was a precursor to the extremely popular service today called DynamoDB. This was a very simple NoSQL database that allowed users to store and retrieve key value data in very low latency. AWS continued to expand the number of services that they have today, and there's more than 250. Now don't worry, you don't need to know about every single one. We'll get more into that later. So this is what AWS decided to do. Take a problem that was ubiquitous in the industry and simplify it so that they could do it for them and charge a small amount. But there's a lot more than simplifying a common problem that makes AWS so popular. So let's get into that now. The first reason is in terms of AWS's cost effectiveness. AWS generally offers a pay-as-you-go model, which means that you only pay when you're actually using the infrastructure. This is in contrast to a lot of other service providers that existed at the time. Usually you had to buy the hardware yourself or enter into these long-running contracts. Not exactly cost-effective unless you needed the hardware for a long period of time. On top of that, AWS is extremely convenient. There's no planning that goes into ordering additional hardware. The third reason is in terms of scalability. And this one, in my opinion, is probably the most important. AWS makes it so that you can launch an application that serves millions, if not billions of users just with a couple clicks of a button. And this is the reason that small companies can host these giant applications that serve millions of users all across the world. They don't need to solve the problem of setting up and maintaining the infrastructure. They just focus on the product that they're developing and leverage the technical infrastructure of cloud providers like AWS to set up and scale their infrastructure. In fact, I was just reading an article the other day that was talking about WhatsApp and how it was originally started with only 20 employees, scaling to millions of users worldwide. This remarkable achievement wouldn't be possible unless they were leveraging cloud service providers that offered scalability. On top of that, AWS is remarkably fast. It has infrastructure nodes set up all across the world so that you can serve your content to your customers in blazing speed. Finally, AWS is extremely reliable. A lot of what goes into building an AWS service is figuring out how you guarantee a very high level of reliability. Now, AWS does sometimes have outages like any company does, but usually these are very limited in their blast radius. But as we'll talk about later when we get to the regions and availability zone sections, you'll understand why AWS is so resilient to outages and why you rarely hear about them. So that's what makes AWS so popular. Let's now talk about some of the core concepts that you need to be aware of in order to be successful. So previously in the lesson, we were talking about these three services, Simple Storage Service, Elastic Compute Cloud, and SimpleDB. These three things are products, but you can think of them also as services. And services are just different types of infrastructure components that offer core functionality in a particular category. In the first one, S3, this is a storage service. Storage services are all about storing your data. The second one, Elastic Compute Cloud, is a compute service. Compute services are all about running applications. The third one, SimpleDB or DynamoDB, is a database. Databases are all about storing and retrieving your data in very low latency. These are three different categories, but there's others as well. Some important ones are monitoring services, security services, and networking services. Each of these offer a unique functionality that the others don't provide. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that some services provide supporting functionality. 
These are services like CloudWatch, which is a monitoring service used to give visibility into how your applications are performing. IAM, or Identity and Access Management, is a security service used to lock down permissions so that only the users or groups that you define have access to certain APIs. And VPC, or Virtual Private Cloud, is a networking service. This is a service that you use to set up your own cloud network, which is isolated from other parts of AWS and the internet itself. On top of that, it's good to know that some services are what I would consider to be low-level building blocks. Services like S3, EC2, and DynamoDB. We've covered all three already. These services offer such simple functionality that they're often used by other AWS services under the hood, so understanding them is definitely important. It's also useful to know that some services are higher level and abstract away certain details. For example, Lambda. Lambda is a compute service. It's very similar to EC2, except that it simplifies the way that you interact with your machine to host applications. Another example is Aurora Serverless. Aurora is a relational database, but what Aurora Serverless does, as you might expect by the name, is they make it so that you don't need to worry about the underlying instance that powers your database. All of that is abstracted away from you so that you can focus on your business problem as opposed to monitoring and maintaining your infrastructure. Now there's a whole lot of AWS services that exist out there, and each of them is powerful in their own right. But it's extremely important to know that the power of using AWS comes from combining services together for extremely powerful functionality. You can do things like set up notifications so that when a file gets uploaded to an S3 bucket, you trigger a piece of code that runs in response to it. You can make it so that when a user signs up for a new account in your application, you automatically send them a welcome email. There's tons of combinations that you can set up with different AWS services to help you solve for very unique use cases. So this is the core idea with AWS services. Let's move on now to two other important topics, regions and availability zones. And we're gonna start by talking about regions. But before we go any further, if you're finding this lesson valuable and want to take the next step, I invite you to check out my AWS courses at the link below. These courses are built around hands-on real projects. So you're not just learning theory, you're actually applying AWS to solve real world problems. They're designed specifically for beginner to intermediate AWS users who want to strengthen their AWS knowledge through practical experience, build projects they can showcase on a resume or in an interview, and gain the confidence to use AWS in real job scenarios. Thousands of students have already used these projects to level up their careers. So if you're serious about learning AWS, this is the best way to accelerate your progress. Just visit the link and get started. Now, earlier when I was describing what makes AWS popular, I mentioned that AWS is extremely fast. But what makes AWS fast? Usually when people say something is fast in the terms of cloud computing, what they really mean is something is low latency. In other words, the speed in which you request a piece of content and the speed in which it returns back to you. The total round trip of that is its latency and lower, AKA faster, is obviously better. So how does AWS help you achieve, quote, fast applications? The answer is in terms of their global infrastructure. So when you're setting up an application and your customers are located in a particular area, say in this case, they're located in North America, what you want in order for your application to be as fast as possible is you wanna place your infrastructure as close to your end customers as possible. So if we have our customers in North America, we also want our infrastructure to also be located somewhere close by in North America as well. Similarly, if our customers are primarily in Europe, then we want our infrastructure to be hosted also in Europe. We don't necessarily want to have the case where a customer in Europe is trying to access data from a data center in North America or vice versa. This would lead to higher latency and not a good experience for your customers. Now, AWS has tons of different infrastructure components that are placed all across the world. And these infrastructure centers are called regions. And this next map here shows you all the different regions that are available in AWS. In total, there's 36, with the teal ones, ones that are already established, and the red ones, those that are launching soon. They're located in every continent in the world except for Antarctica. Now, some of the most popular and oldest regions are the ones that follow. So over here on the west coast of North America, this is US West 2. On the east coast of North America is US East 1. And over here in Great Britain is EU West 1. 
These are the oldest and largest data centers. So as you can see, AWS pretty much has something for everyone. So you're able to set up your infrastructure in one or more region here. So if you have a global application that has customers in many different locations all across the world, you can set up your infrastructure in one or more regions and then direct the traffic to whatever region is closest to your end customer through routing rules. And this is something we'll touch on more in upcoming lessons. So that's what AWS regions are, essentially different locations all across the world to host your infrastructure. Now let's talk about availability zones. So first I'll start out by throwing some facts at you, but later on we'll get into an example to explain this more in detail. So firstly, availability zones are isolated locations that are located within a region that help reduce the likelihood of application outages. So the idea with availability zones is that when you set up a piece of infrastructure, behind the scenes, AWS will replicate either the compute infrastructure or the data into separate physical locations within that region. And if there's ever an outage in any one of those availability zones, say a flood, tornado, storm, you name it, and that location is down, then traffic can easily be routed to the other availability zones that are located within the region. All in all, availability zones help add an extra layer of resiliency to your application to handle unexpected outages. Now, each region contains multiple availability zones, and we'll see an example of this shortly. Now, within each availability zone is at least one, often more, different data centers. And these data centers have separate power, networking, and internet. This means that if any data center within the availability zone goes down, then the other data centers within it will still be able to handle traffic. And if all the data centers in a single availability zone go down, then there's nothing to worry about either because other availability zones will also take over serving traffic. So let's take a look at an example to make this more concrete. So here is the east coast of the United States, the state of Virginia here. And we're gonna look at US East 1, which is one of those popular regions we spoke about before. You can take a look at the legend on the left-hand side here. The dotted line represents the region, the purple circles represent the availability zones, and the green circles represent the data center itself. So US East 1 is located within Virginia, and in total, it has six availability zones. And the names of these availability zones are as follows. They're usually denoted by the name of the region, followed by a dash, followed by a letter. So US East 1A, 1B, 1C, so on and so forth. Now, AWS doesn't actually tell anyone where the availability zones are located beyond just a general area. So there's no easy way to know where these availability zones are within Virginia. So I'll just put some pink dots here to represent what their distribution probably looks like. So let's zoom in to the one furthest to the left. Within this availability zone, there could be multiple different data centers, three green dots. Now let's imagine that one data center fails. In this case, the other two data centers within the availability zone are more than capable of taking over the incoming traffic from the one that's currently experiencing an issue. Now, what if those two other data centers go down as well? Well, it's not really to worry about either because there's still five other availability zones with a whole bunch of other data centers within them that can still continue to serve traffic. So this is the idea of availability zones. They're isolated locations within the region that help ensure your applications can be more resilient to catastrophic outages. Now, just to summarize some key points from this lesson. First, remember that services are AWS products and they offer functionality in a variety of different categories. Second, remember that regions enable low latency for your applications. The closer that your infrastructure is to your end customers, the faster your applications will be. Third, availability zones are used to provide high availability in the case of infrastructure failures. Fourth, you'll need to select which region to deploy your infrastructure to. This is something that you do when you're using the AWS console, or if you're creating your infrastructure programmatically, you need to supply the region that you'd like to deploy to. And fifth, occasionally you'll need to select the number of desired availability zones for your infrastructure. Now, a lot of AWS services handle this for you and you don't need to select this. So I hope this lesson was useful in giving you a background on key AWS concepts. I'll see you in the next one.